Hi, all. Hey. Welcome hey. to. Hey. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome, uh, welcome to Haystack. Um, uh, everybody made it, it seems. Uh, this is going to be a really great couple of days. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, also, I, just thanks to OSC. Everybody give a round of applause to OSC for putting this on, because this is going to be great. Um, a lot of people worked really hard on this. Um, and we also had to do all our client work, too, which was a lot of fun um, while we were doing that. So uh, personally, I'd like to really thank uh, everybody at OSC, because I joined in October. And it's just been so great to work with the team. And they brought me on. They were so welcoming. And the work is just awesome. The team is awesome. The work that we do with all of our clients is really great. Um, and I know I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. And it's really a pleasure to work with all of you and to know all of you. And uh, you know, all of us are the community of Search. And it's a really great and growing community. So give yourselves a round of applause as well, because this is really cool. <laughs> and those of you who don't not know me, they're like, who's this dude talking? And I've never seen him before. I'm Max Irwin. Um, I'm a managing consultant with OSC. Uh, I am very honored to be able to do the keynote at this conference. Uh, before I get started, however, we've got a bunch of announcements. I'm going to leave like the talks up here so you can like listen to all the things that I have to say and then kind of decide what you want to go watch. Um, so we've got also a Haystack EU coming, and we've got the dates now. So Haystack EU is going to be in Berlin. It's going to be October 28th, and we're going to have the conference and two days of training in various training courses. Um, you're already here. Some of you may be going to the EU conference, but I think this is being recorded right now. So those of you who are watching TV and you didn't get a chance to come to this conference, go to EU. OK, last year. Raise your hand if you were here last year. Yeah. Um, I already know how many people were here last year. We're data people, right? So we already knew that number. Um, but thanks for raising your hand. Uh, so we had 110 people. And now we've got uh, 150. Um, and it was a great conference. There's a photo that's like blurred out. This was supposed to be like a really cool like animated slide with Hollywood magic. But there's no animations because of the presentation issue that I'm having. So we're going to miss out on a couple cool little Hollywood magic animations. But that's fine. I'll explain stuff. But there's a photo here. Um, from the brewery, we had the talks at like a brewery and then in the OSC offices. And it was, uh, it was just really grassroots and a lot of, a lot of good stuff going on. Um, so we're going to have photos of the conference this year, and it's going to look a lot more professional. Uh, we talked about open search advancements. Um, Doug and Eric, they talked about plungers. So with open source search, we talked about plungers because you have these things that are being rebuilt over and over and over inside, proprietary, behind closed doors. And we wanted to release things to the community so not everybody has to rebuild them all the, all the time. So uh, the context of that last year was the Learning to Rank plugin for Elasticsearch. Um, we're going to get a talk uh, from uh, Cease, Alessandro is going to talk about a rated ranking evaluator, which is a new uh, measurement tool, which is another plunger kind of thing that people have built over and over and over. And there's a lot of these great things that are coming out of the community that really help bootstrap a lot of the, the tedium of search that everybody has to build over and over again. So this year, we're going to talk about relevance. We're going to talk about relevance in the context of people and machines. Um, and how do we kind of marry the two together? Because there are different ideas of relevance that people and machines have, right? Uh, and we usually like to talk about relevance in the overall context of search quality. So <coughs> if, you, uh, if you have seen like a, a blog post, there's a Venn diagram going around. So there's relevance, there's experience, and there's performance. So we think about all of the complicated ways that we have to address people's needs. And we also have to address the needs of 
the machines that drive search for, for people. Um, and this is, uh, this is really the big picture. And this is the, really, this is the th reason that we're all here. Because we see a lot of um, promises that are made. Um, everybody in this room is probably guilty of promises being made. Um, this is just a list of some of the, uh, some of the products that are offered. Um, and they're awesome. And you can use them to do amazing things. But when you look and you see like the marketing buzzwords of like cognitive search, AI, uh, NLU, smart data, things like that, you have to stop and think, well, what does that mean? How do you accomplish these things? How do you put this stuff together? What are the hard parts? Because it, you know, if you're familiar with machine learning, data science, you have to have uh, an absolute. You have to have an absolute concept of success. You have to know exactly what it means to improve, and you have to have a goal that you, you know, if you're doing gradient descent or whatever, because it's just math, right? It just comes down to math, and math is an absolute. There's no, like, fuzziness that exists like it does in people's minds of, like, oh, yeah, that's kind of good enough. That's, that's it. You, you have to have solid numbers and facts and your formula to train these things. Um, but for people, you know, when you ask people what it means to be successful in search, that's, well, you're going to get a lot of different answers because people don't always know. And it's a really, really, really hard thing to do. It's really hard to say, I know exactly what my users need. And I know exactly how to get our software and our technology and our content to address those needs. So there's like this total mismatch, right? There's this mismatch between, well, we have this concept of AI and it's going to take over the world and everything's going to be perfect and awesome and beautiful. But we can't tell machines how to do that. We don't know yet. And it's a big, it's a big issue that we're having. Um, so we have to first pause and take a look at the relevance engineer's brain. And we have to say, well, relevance engineer, please tell me what relevance is and how do you handle relevance? Because we want to make this connection. Because relevance engineers deal with the machiney parts. And they are the translators between, between what, <coughs> what the business is saying that they need for customers and between the search engine and all the stack that fits in between the two. And they might say, well, this is relevance. Th please raise your hand if you know what this is. All right, cool. Yes, you passed the test. Uh, this is NDCG. So this is a metric, or a normalized discounted cumulative gain. Um, this is a metric that we use to measure relevance in, uh, in a search engine. And you might have a query and some judgments. And you might run it against NDCG, and you'll get something like this. Like, this is just a number between 0 and 1. And you're like, OK, great. So it says 0 0.7925. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to have this number? Well, the formula tells me that this, there's this number. It's between 0 and 1. It's kind of closer to 1. It's like 0.8. I was like, that's pretty good, right? Maybe. So how does it work? Like, we got to know how this thing works. And this was supposed to be animated. I'm sorry, I'm just like throwing this all up at once. But if I do the animation, like the, it's going to crop off half of the picture. So we've, we just say, well, this is for one. If we do for one query, we say for all the results, every, every result that I get in my query, I'm going to award a result by its relevance. And depending on where it is in the rank, I'm going to punish it by its rank. So if it's lower in the list, it, it, Gets, it gets more punishment. And then I just divide that, and then I add the scores for all the, all the results. Right? So let's, let's go over that again. So for all the results, I award a result by its relevance. I punish a result by its rank. And I add the scores. Piece of cake. And that was for DCG. That's not in DCG. That's a, it's a little bit simpler. I'm not going to go into the deep stuff. 
Well, what does this look like? So imagine if we had every single possible relevance between 0 and 4, or 0 and 3, for the first, for the first four results. So I've got relevance of document in position 1, relevance of document in position 2, in position 3, and in position 4. Right? So at the very top, we see, well, all of them are 0. All of them are irre irrelevant. And that gives me NDCG of 0. And then we start seeing, well, more relevant results are starting to fill in. And this is for everything. So you see the dots. Like, if I, if I do this for every possible thing, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start at 0, and it's going to eventually get to 1. right? And we see, well, we could just plot this. And this is kind of what NDCG G looks like. Right? We just say, well, all of the possible relevance results that we're ever going to get for the top four, it's going to be one of these points in this, in this graph. And you can see it kind of starts at point 0.5. And that's pretty interesting. Um, well, we can kind of tweak NDCG also. And we can make that punishment that I was talking about, we can make it more harsh. Or we can make it more lenient. And this is just if I changed the denominator um, from log base 2 uh, of x to some other denominator. And, uh, and we can see that we can change this. And we can, we can kind of play around with the formula. And there's no hard and fast rule for exactly what you're supposed to do. Because um, it's math, and we try to tune math to fit our needs. But we got a problem, right? Because there's the problem. What's well, relevance? Like, we don't know what that is yet. We're trying to measure relevance, but we've got to know what's relevant before we can measure it. So you've got to know which documents are relevant. So we've got to go, and we've got to figure out what relevance is. And these are just you know, dictionary definitions. Relevance denotes how well a retrieved document meets a user's information need. OK, that's, that's nice. Uh, what's an information need? An information need is a desire to locate and obtain information to satisfy a conscious or unconscious need. Um, well, that's kind of tricky because if uh, a person who's using your search product doesn't consciously know up front what's relevant, then how are you, sitting in the trenches of search engineering, supposed to know what the user would think is relevant. And this is, a, this is an open problem, right? This, this is an open problem that we have. So we try, to fill, we try to fill this gap through proxy. We try to say, OK, we've got experts who are deeply in touch with our customers, with our users. And we ask them to judge documents. And we ask them to see, like, oh, these documents are relevant. These documents are not relevant for this query. And here's a big list of stuff. And you can take that, and you can use that and as your guide, your golden set for measurement. Um, and we also measure this stuff from logs. And we also try to grab stuff out of the logs and say, well, we have this certain level in, of engagement um, for these queries. And we're going to kind of translate that. Let's, uh, let's think about the first one for a minute. Um, because how do we know if the experts that are giving us this data if they're judging correctly. And this, this is a big problem, too. Because just because you ask somebody doesn't mean they absolutely know. Also, they're acting as an agent, as a proxy for, for a customer base, for, for users. So how do you know that they're like thinking in the same mindset as a person would be when they're actually using your product? So then we turn to something called interrater reliability. Interrater reliability came out of uh, the psychology field um, in the 60s and 70s uh, because psychologists have this problem where the brain is like this, the ultimate black box, right? Uh, you can have a patient, and you're trying to diagnose a patient um, with a psychological disorder or you know just trying to figure out what their emotions are and how they feel. And if you ask different doctors what the diagnosis is, you might get different answers. And there have been studies about this, um, again, going way back. So they had to figure out, well, how do we know that this is accurate? How do we know that this is true? Um, 
And what's the level of agreement between these people who are diagnosing this patient? If you have five different doctors and they give different diagnoses to the patient, then, well, which one's right? So then we turn to the work of someone like uh, this gentleman, uh, Dr. Klaus Griffendorf, um, or also uh, uh, Dr. Fleiss, and we can say, well, there are formula to be able to measure disagreement. So Dr. Griffendorf developed what's known as alpha, and alpha is a coefficient that measures inter-rater reliability. So you give it a bunch of data of here are the judgments from the raters, and they say, well, I, I, I give this one, I give this one, I give this one between the raters, and then you get a number out of that, of agreement. So you might do that with your relevance ratings. You might say, hey, we've got all this data from our subject matter experts, from all of our judges who are telling us what's relevant or not, and you might plug it in, and maybe you'll get a number, oh, sorry, oops. <laughs> um, so you take that and you, and you plug this in to, uh, to this formula to get a number. So this is the, the, the DO is the disagreement observed, and the DE is the disagreement expected by chance. So imagine like you just picked judgments at random, and that's by pure chance. And then you have the disagreement observed between your raters, and you divide the two, and that measures disagreement, and then to, to get agreement, you subtract it from one. Right? And you might get a number like this. So this is just like a percent. So we can say, well, our raters are 14.5% in agreement with each other. Um, OK, that's, that's great. Uh, well, what does that mean? So our raters maybe aren't agreeing with each other. Or maybe they are. Maybe this number is really high. Um, in which case, that's, that's nice. You can, you can run with it. But if it's not, then you're like, oh, now what do I have to do? So you have to go deeper down the rabbit hole. And you have to say, well, who's doing well with this whole agreement thing and disagreement thing? So this is a book written by Alprad, uh, Alprad uh, Elo. And who's heard of the Elo rating system? All right, a bunch of people. Cool. So Elo developed this, uh, this system. Um, and it was published in this book. I have this first edition book, The Ratings of Chess Players, which is really cool. And basically, it's just a way to uh, score a competition between players, and you get a rating. So you can use this for chess. This is, that's where it's most used. Here's, here's, a, here's a graph that's being used for tennis. Um, this is taken from a blog post from uh, Betfair. right? So they ran this against Federer and Nadal and Murray. And they said, OK, well, here are the ELO ratings over time. And these are like the grandmasters of tennis. Right? So you can see the ratings are quite high. If you know ELO, the ELO system, like 2,500 is pretty high in, in, in terms of ratings. So you can do this rating for this competition. Well, maybe we can use this also to, uh, to kind of score our raters for agreement or disagreement. So let's award ELO points if people are likely to agree and take points away if they're likely to disagree. So how are we going to do that? Well, we've got this very simple example. So we've got a query, and we've got some document, right? And we've got three raters. So the first two raters said, hey, for this query, this document is relevant. Yay. Um, the third raider says, no, I don't think that document is relevant. Well, the first two, they agreed. So let's give them a point. And the, the other one who disagreed, let's take away a point. So if we do this enough times, and we say, well, I've got 100, 106 crowdsourced raters, and they gave 50,000 judgments. And this was uh, data from Trek uh, from 2010. And they sent out this task to, uh, to Mechanical Turk to get, to get people to judge, uh, to judge relevance on documents versus queries. And there's a lot of data. So this is great data. So we've got 50,000 judgments. And now we can see if we play this game with all these raters and over and over and over, and we assign them each a rating, we start at 1, and we say, OK, well, we're just going to throw them into ELO. We can see that some people agree and some people disagree. And it's pretty, di it's pretty uh, diverse. Like, you get a really big mix. Um, 
But how do you know like, who's right? Like, just because somebody's likely to disagree, does that mean they're wrong? Or does that mean their contexts are different and their mindsets are different? Because really, the problem is, is that when I'm searching for something, I'm always right. Because I know what I need. I've got my own context. I'm special. I'm unique. It's subjective. And that's the problem. And uh, it's a good one. <laughs> it's a good problem to have because it's interesting. It's interesting, and we and we work really hard because um, we're you know we're problem solvers, and we're like, all right, challenge accepted. Let's do it. Let's try to let's try to solve the problem for everybody. So then we say, all right, well, let's look at data. Like those those uh, those experts. It's like, yeah, thanks for the thanks for the judgments. Um, we want to we wanna use those and, we, and, and figure out what's relevant. And we also want to just look at the data that we got, because we want to see the behavior that's coming in through the system. So this was supposed to be like some awesome animated slide <laughs> uh, with this werewolf like popping out of the woods. But basically, you could have this total mis mismatch of you've got all these expert judges telling you this is relevant. We should you know, tune to this. And then you're like, oh, in this happy forest. And then all of a sudden, you push it live. And then the customers are like, oh, engagement drops. And everything's horrible. And that's the werewolf, right? And that's no fun. Um, and uh, here's, here's basically the problem. The problem is that we see this data. And we see, well, we've got these actions that are happening in our system. Maybe somebody gets what they need from the first result. Maybe they got to go to the second page. Maybe they got to refine a couple times, and they're getting frustrated. Uh, or maybe it never happens, and they never do anything, and they throw their laptop out the window because your search is not doing what, it wants, uh, what they want it to do. Um, so this, we can just say, well, it, this is time. Like It takes time to do these things. We could say, well, all right, the first result, bing, like two seconds. I got it. Thank you. The second page, I got to go down. I got to click. OK, it's going to take me 20 seconds. And then, oh, the second page didn't work. I got to refine. I got to do some more stuff. And it's like a couple minutes later. And you're like, OK, finally. But I'm pretty angry by that point. And I've, I've exhausted a lot of effort to get there. Or I never do, and then the universe dies eventually. Um, so really, like, how many, how many seconds are we taking before we give the customer what they need. Because people are very impatient these days. And raise your hand if, ever, if anybody said, like, why, don't you, why doesn't your search work like Google? Like, <laughs> right? Um, it, they set a high bar. So that's really, that's really the thing. People are so impatient because they've been trained to like, get stuff instantly from people who spend billions of dollars and with an army of PhDs to be able to get there. And you're like, well, I've got a search team of like me and like a business analyst, and like well, there's this there's this other person over here, um, and I got to compete with Google. That's that's fun. <laughs> so we'll go back and we'll say, all right, I've got this problem. I've got my NDCG and I've got all these possible values, and how am I going to translate that into into what the business really needs, into what the customer really needs? And I'm just going to do some like little math magic. And I'm going to say, I'm going to flip this upside down. And I'm going to map it to seconds. And I'm going to say, well, what if we take NDCG and we map it to seconds? And how long it takes the customer to get something? I just inverted the graph. And we have to tie these two things together. We have to say, well, I'm the relevance engineer. I know what NDCG is. And this was a really open question. Um, it was a really big question. We gave training earlier in the week. And uh, a lot of people during the first day of training, they said, well, we don't know, we don't know how to map like, the concept of relevance to engagement of customers and what, it, and what that means. And maybe you can do something like this. You, but you need a methodology. And this is just one possible hack to do this. And you say, well, OK, I've just inverted the graph. And I say, I'm just going to, instead of saying like some NDCG number, 
I'm going to say, well, this is, I'm going to map that number to some seconds. I'm going to say, hey, Mr. Product Owner, uh, don't worry about my NDCG score. Here's how I think, I think it's going to take this many seconds for the user to get what they need, um, instead of trying to play around with all these abstract numbers. But that's, that's really just the methodology that you need for your business. Um, and we know that teams who have a relevance methodology and they align this relevance methodology are going to be way more successful in helping their customers with search than those who don't, if you're just walking around blind and trying to poke around and play with fancy technology without understanding the real problem. And you know, you can map this to anything. You could say, well, shares, purchases, connections, whatever your problem is, is like, you know, you gotta you gotta know how to measure engagement for your business. Um, you gotta know what your customers need. So we're here as a community to kind of have some therapy around this problem, <laughs> uh, to reflect with each other, uh, to learn from each other, and to grow and to, to push the needle and to make things to make things better. And that's why we're here for Haystack. So thank you and welcome.